Today's video is brought to you by Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury attorney law firm ready to fight for you. When dealing with the consequence of injury, sometimes it can feel like you have no options and that receiving proper compensation just isn't plausible. But Morgan & Morgan is here to fight for you. Did you know that proper representation from a lawyer is said to gain on average three times more compensation than fighting a case on your own? With 800 attorneys in 49 different states covering a major range of specialties and expertise, Morgan & Morgan will fight to get you the compensation you deserve. And the best part, Morgan & Morgan operates using a no-win, no-fee basis to put your mind at ease while you focus on getting justice. If you're interested in what you hear, check out Morgan & Morgan for yourself by clicking the link in the description of this video, or using your phone, you can dial pound law. That's pound 529. Or visit www.forthepeople.com to get started on receiving the compensation you deserve. According to the testimony of Colombo crime family capo turned government witness, Dino Big Dino Calabro, Carmine the Gorilla Cargado Jr. wouldn't stay down even after Joey Cave's Compatiello shot Cargano twice, including one shot to the eye. When the gorilla attempted to get up after being hit with two bullets, Joey Caves admitted he then took a sledgehammer and bashed the 230-pound, 6'2 gorilla in the head to knock him down. The murder took place in 1994 at an auto body shop in Brooklyn called Sunshine Collision, according to Big Dino. During the trial, which Dino was the star witness against Colombo crime boss Thomas Tommy Schatz Gioli, Calabro admitted to taking part in eight murders along with his boss, and pointed out his boss Tommy shot Gioli, claiming Gioli turned him on to the gangster lifestyle and taught him how to kill. Big Dino would also testify he didn't know why Cargano was killed, but upon hearing about the hit from Joey Compatiello, Calabro told him, quote, I don't care what you do with him, throw him out the car, bury him where he sits. Calabro also informed the courts that he kept his boss Tommy Schatz abreast on the hit and told him about the murder and where he was buried. Calabro stated that he and Joey Compatiello buried the body outside the auto body shop in Brooklyn on McDonald Avenue, where the lot was being used to store ice cream trucks. But when Cargano's family started asking questions and snooping around about Cargano, they dug up his body and transported the body to an industrial park in Farmingdale, Long Island. Calabro, along with Compatiello, then covered the body with a bag of lime to try and kill the smell of the decaying corpse. It was a crippling blow to one of the nation's most notorious crime families. The acting boss of the Colombo crime family, Thomas Gioli, a.k.a. Tommy Schatz, along with eight other suspected mobsters, were arrested Wednesday. A total of 12 people face federal charges, including murder, robbery, extortion, and drug dealing. Charging 12 defendants associated with the Colombo organized crime family. In a press conference, the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office said the shakedown, which involved years of undercover work, shed light on mob crimes dating back to the 1990s, a time when family control led to bloodshed. We are able today to bring closure to cold case murders and other violent crimes, crimes implicating the most powerful members of the Colombo family. According to the prosecutors at the trial, Gioli advanced in the mob life by overseeing a lethal crew of killers, which included Big Dino Calabro and his cousin, Dino Little Dino Saracino. Calabro talked about his first hit in 1991 when he took out Banano associate Frank Chestnut Marasa. Calabro stated Tommy shot schooled him on how to kill, telling Calabro, quote, shoot him in the body first, then walk up and cap him. Calabro told the courts he and Gioli committed six murders together, including Joe Misio, who was whacked for stealing a Mercedes-Benz from the Marco Polo restaurant in Carroll Gardens, Brooklyn, which belonged to a Gambino soldier. Calabro stated Gioli told the Gambino family he took care of the problem and that no more cars would be stolen from the garage. All of this information came to light in 2008 when a low-level drug dealer named Anton Basile started cooperating with the FBI after being charged with the murder that took place in 1992. Basile would tell the feds how Calabro and Gioli were very tight and Gioli was Calabro's right-hand man and mentor. Dino and Tommy met in 1989 and not long after, he became Gioli's driver and chief enforcer or hitman. Dino even moved his family to a property in Farmingdale, Long Island, and was living adjacent to his boss, Tommy Schatz, 
and even made Gioli the godfather of his children. In one article online, Tommy Schatz Gioli is compared to Greg Scarpa, nicknamed the Grim Reaper, calling Gioli the suburban Scarpa. During the 1990s, Greg Scarpa turned Brooklyn into a war zone, racking up body after body during the Colombo family civil war, referred to as the Arena Persico War. What people didn't know until later on is the Grim Reaper was simultaneously working as a confidential informant for the FBI as he was still out on the street causing havoc in New York City, making Scarpa basically untouchable. While Scarpa was doing his thing, he also had an ally out on Long Island, which was Thomas Tommy Schatz Gioli. Tommy Schatz would fly under the radar during his 10-year murder spree where him and his crew of violent killers would rack up nine bodies. According to information given by the Grim Reaper, Thomas Gioli would be straightened out on January 9th, 1987, and it was also around that time that Gioli began mentoring his nephew, Tommy McLaughlin, and Big Dino. It's said when Calabro moved to the U.S. from Sicily as a kid, he knew no English and would drop out of school to sell drugs on the street corners of Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. His introduction into the world of organized crime in New York would come through a high school friend and low-level gangster named John Pellegreco, who brought Calabro to the infamous Wimpy Boy Social Club on 13th Avenue in Brooklyn, where John Pellegreco's brother Mario was a full-time member. Pellegreco and Calabro would start doing burglaries and stealing cars, and would show up to the Wimpy Boy Social Club to talk about the work they were putting in. Almost 30 years later, when Calabro was testifying against his former comrades, he would explain how he fell in love with guys like Greg Scarpa's lifestyle. He would be quoted saying, I seen older guys with dress suits on and cars and jewelry in the middle of the day. He would go on to say that was what he wanted to do. I didn't want to work. That's the kind of life I wanted. Not long after meeting and hanging around the Wimpy Boys crew, Calabro would catch a grand larceny and attempt a burglary rap which would land him a one and a half to four and a half year state prison sentence. Upon his release, Calabro would link back up with his old friend Palo Greco and would become best friends with another Brooklyn hood named Richie Greaves. And with that friendship, Calabro would become acquainted with a few more neighborhood gangsters on the rise, such as John Baldazza, whose uncle was a big time Colombo member, one of Tommy Karate's on the record associates named Anthony Basile, and Gioli's nephew, Irish Tommy McLaughlin. The crew of Jits would hang out at sports bars around Brooklyn such as the Sports Page, the Home Stretch, and the Getty on Kings Highway where Calabro would meet Gioli for the first time. By 1989, Gioli had built himself an empire of illegal joker poker machines and establishments all around from Brooklyn to Long Island, which would earn him the moniker of Tommy Machines. Before long, Gioli would begin mentoring Calabro and had him accompanying him to collect the proceeds from his gambling rackets. And at some point around 1989, Gioli would send Calabro and Gioli's nephew, Tommy McLaughlin, on a mission to give a man named Joe the Banker Monty a beating in broad daylight. According to Calabro's testimony, he was never told why they were to give the man a beating, except that Gioli told them he was a dirty old man. Needless to say, the two men waited for the man to come out of a Brooklyn meat market and they proceeded to beat him up as they were told, which would solidify Calabro as a trusted and willing soldier for Gioli, showing he wasn't afraid to put in work. Calabro, along with Greaves and McLaughlin, would then introduce the rest of their crew, known as the Bay Parkway Boys, to Gioli. One of those men would later be described as Calabro's protege, Joseph Joey Caves Compatiello who was five years younger than Calabro. Caves was described as a tough kid and was first arrested at 13 years old for driving a stolen car across the Verrazano Bridge. According to prosecutors at the 2008 trial headlined by Colombo acting boss Thomas Tommy Schatz Gioli, Big Dino Calabro would testify to carrying out six cold-blooded murders alongside his mentor, boss, and friend Tommy Schatz, which included NYPD officer Ralph Doles, as well as the 1999 execution of former Colombo underboss William Wild Bill Cotolo, who was killed by Gioli, Calabro, and Saracino in Saracino's basement and transported to the crew's personal graveyard in Farmingdale. 
Gioli's lethal crew would be comprised of the young Brooklyn hoods that made up a notorious mafia farm team known as the Bay Parkway Boys, to which Gioli, who was nearly 15 years older than Calabro, would act as a mentor to the up-and-coming gangsters in training, schooling them on how to effectively stick up stores, do home invasions, burglarize banks, and ultimately murder their rivals. Gioli would become especially close with Dino Calabro, who Gioli met through his nephew and one of the creators of the Bay Parkway Boys, Thomas Irish Tommy McLaughlin, outside the Getty gas station on Kings Highway in Brooklyn, which was one of the Bay Parkway Boys crew's main hangouts, and would immediately take a liking to him. Calabro, who was born in Sicily and migrated to the U.S. as a young boy, would later be quoted during his testimony in regards to Gioli stating, I wanted what he had. He had the power to get me in, referring to Gioli's ties to Cosa Nostra and his ability to introduce Calabro into the life as well. Tommy Schatz was born in 1953 to parents Salvatore and Julie Gioli and grew up in Farmingdale, Long Island. Around 19 years old, he would find himself around high-ranking members of the Perfacci Colombo crime family to an acquaintance by the name Jojo Russo, whose father was one of the Colombo family's biggest up-and-coming gangsters. Andrew Andy Mush Russo, who was also a cousin to the family's then imprisoned boss Carmine Snake Persico, and was attending meetings with high ranking members from all different families on Persico's behalf during his incarceration. Through Gioli's friendship with the Russos, he would become a familiar face in mafia circles on both Long Island and in Brooklyn, leading him up to serving his first stint in prison in the 1970s for robbery charges. Upon his release in 1980, with Andy Mush now being locked up on bribery charges, Gioli would become an on-the-record associate of his capo and Russo's nephew, Anthony Chucky Russo. Despite Chucky's relationship to Andy Mush, in order to get made, he would still have to make his bones, which he is said to have done on January 4th, 1982, along with the help of Gioli, who was allegedly down the street waiting in a crash car, along with another Brooklyn gangster named Joseph Carner, aka Junior Lollipops, who was also in a crash car, where a nun would be caught in the crossfire and killed. The targets of the assassination were said to be father and son porno business tycoons, Joseph Perino Jr. and Joseph Perino Sr. Apparently, five shotgun blasts were let off by a four-man hit team, striking Joe Jr. in the chest and killing him instantly, but the father would take off running, leading the hit team on a chase through Gravesend, Brooklyn, ultimately leading them into the apartment of a former nun named Veronica Zerwa. Zerwa was innocently hanging shirts in a closet when Perino busted through the doors trying to avoid the shooters. Perino would be hit in the butt and would survive the hit attempt, but Zerwa wouldn't be so lucky. The four shooters on the hit were said to be Frankie, Blue Eyes Sparacco, Jimmy Angelino, John Minerva, and Salvatore Big Sal Misiota. Misiota being the one responsible for accidentally killing the nun. The day after the murder, the infamous killing machine Greg Scarpa would confirm who was behind the botched hit to his FBI handler and inform them that Joe Jr. and Joe Sr. were major players in the porn business and had recently graduated to a large-scale drug dealing operation. According to Scarpa, the hit was put on the father and son for refusing to take part in a hit ordered by Paul Castellano on top of a few other incidents which left the duo in bad standing with the family, leaving Colombo boss Carmine Persico no choice but to have them whacked. Big Sal Michiota would eventually flip and tell authorities about the hit, but by that point, all of the men involved were either dead or in prison, and Michiota never placed Gioli at the scene in the car until about 20 years later when he changed his story. Gioli would deny he was ever there, and the feds would never pursue charges. The Bay Parkway boys would become a key farm team for the Colombo crime family, similarly to the Bath Avenue crew, which was based out of Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, where members of the Banano crime family would scout and recruit members to bring into the life. By 1991, the members of the Bay Parkway Boys would consist of the crew's leader, Tommy Schatz Gioli, who was 38 years old. Then you had Big Dino Calabro, who was 24 years old. Richie Greaves, who was 22 years old. Irish Tommy McLaughlin, who was 22 years old. Joseph Joey Caves Compatiello, who was 19. 
Little Dino Saracino, who is 18 years old, and Little Dino's older brother, Sebi Saracino, who is 26. Then you had a small-time thief with ties to the Bonanno family named Anthony Kenny, and last but not least, a 19-year-old stick-up artist named Awab O.J. Inab. It's said the crew would pull off bank burglaries where they would steal money from ATMs and drop boxes, netting upwards of $20,000 in one shot, and would then use the money to expand Tommy Machine's Joker Poker racket, buying more machines that he would put in eateries, bars, and storefronts. The profits would typically be split 50-50 with the owner, and if the owners refused to do business with the crew, they would be extorted into it. In the case where the crew made off with $20,000 in cash, it said Calabro busted through the wall of a Farmingdale bank and emerged with stacks of cash from an ATM, where Compatiello was waiting outside as the getaway driver. The duo would then split the money with Gioli. In another instance, it said Tommy Schatz arranged for Big Dino and Richie Greaves to rob a drug dealer by sending them to the dealer's house disguised as flower delivery men. Once they gained entry into the house, the two gangsters pulled out their pistols, handcuffed the occupants, and stole a safe loaded with guns and drugs. In another case, it said Calabro, Gioli, and Greaves staked out one of the owners of a Long Island market waiting until the market closed, where they would then run up on the owners in the street and take bags full of cash off their possession. On top of armed robberies and bank burglaries, the crew was also known for hijacking trailers and trucks filled with merchandise. It's said Gioli even rented out a warehouse in Long Island to store the stolen goods. One of the crew's most successful heists would come in the form of 150 high-end fur coats estimated to be worth $900,000, where on February 11th, 1991, at 6.45 p.m., a three-man crew consisting of Gioli, Calabro, and Compatiello entered a store called Furs by Mina in Syosset, Long Island, posing as a father and two sons shopping for Valentine's Day. Once inside and while using police scanners to listen for police, the three men drew guns and handcuffed the store owners. It said the money earned from the heist was used to pay for Dino Calabro's wedding with his wife Andrea. Despite being successful in many robberies, the crew also had its streaks of bad luck too, having to call off certain jobs due to silent alarms, chance encounters, and lack of preparation. Now getting back to the crew's darker side, on March 25th, 1992, Gioli and Calabro were said to have committed a double murder of a Colombo soldier loyal to the Arena faction named John Minerva and Minerva's friend Michael Impergano, who was targeted simply for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. On March 27, 1992, Gioli would be on the receiving end of some bullets after getting into a car chase shootout in Brooklyn. Gioli would be hit multiple times but would survive the shots. Calabro would testify that the murder of Bonanno associate Frank Chestnut Marasa was ordered by Gioli as a retaliation for the murder of their fellow Colombo associate, Ajab O.J. Inab, who Marasa executed while he was sitting in his car after O.J. had hit Marasa in the head with a baseball bat over a personal beef. Calabro stated the crew was enraged over O.J.'s murder, and when they drove to Gioli's house to find out what to do about it, Gioli would tell them, take an eye for an eye, and instructed the men to get two shooters, a driver, and a kill car, and another driver in a crash car. The kill car to carry the armed shooters, and a crash car to slam into police in case of a police chase. The hit crew would sit on Marasa's house one night, wearing ski masks and gloves, armed with 38 caliber handguns. Upon Marasa's arrival, Calabro would tell the courts he emptied the gun into Marasa. Calabro would also testify to carrying out the murder of their friend and fellow crew member Richard Greaves on orders from Gioli because of Greaves' refusal to kick up proceeds from a robbery he committed and for talking about wanting to leave the life to start a legitimate business in Arizona. On August 3, 1995, Greaves would be lured to the basement of Saracino's house in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, and be shot in the head while sitting at a table talking. Calabro stated that although Greaves fell over onto the floor and blood was squirting out of his head, he was still alive. The men would proceed to choke Greaves until he stopped breathing. Calabro would be charged along with others for the felony murder of an armored truck driver named Carlos Pagan, who was shot and killed in a botched robbery on January 9, 1992, 
while Pagan and a co-worker were delivering money to a check cash in place in Brooklyn. One of the crew's more notable hits would also take place in Dino and Sebi's basement, nicknamed The Dungeon, where the two brothers' parents lived above in an apartment. Like Greaves, William Wild Bill Cotolo, who was Colombo family underboss, would be lured to the basement where it said he would be shot in the head at point blank range and then wrapped in a blue tarp and transported to the Farmingdale burial site. Through all the murders, heists, robberies, and odd jobs Gioli was a part of throughout his years, even surviving the violent and deadly Colombo Civil War that would claim over a dozen lives from 1991 to 1993. Jolie had managed to do a pretty good job flying under the radar and for the most part keeping him and his crew out of prison. From the late 80s up until 2008, Jolie was considered to be in the upper echelon of the Colombo family and was a major contributor to bringing the two rival families back under one flag by maintaining good relationships with various members on both sides and would also help bring the Colombos back into the good graces of New York's five families. Despite Gioli's best efforts to stay out of the law enforcement sights, by 2008, at 55 years old, Gioli could feel the walls closing in around him. For the last four years since 2004, between subpoenas and search warrants, Gioli knew his time was limited, but was still hopeful. Gioli would call a meeting with Dino Calabro and Joey Compatiello at the Lady of Lords Church in Massapequa, Long Island, to discuss his future plans as then acting boss of the Colombo family, as well as the future of his two closest friends. By this point, Anthony Basile had been picked up by the feds and agreed to cooperate against his former friends. With that in mind, Gioli told his two friends that if he managed to beat the charges against them, he would retire from the life. He said he would spend his retirement living it out with his wife in their modest two-story home. According to Gioli, he had money put away from all of his scores over the years and still had a decent cash flow from his Joker poker machines placed throughout the city. But unfortunately for the acting boss, things wouldn't quite go down as peacefully as he had planned. In May of 2008, indictments would come down on Gioli, Calabro, Compatiello, and Saracino, as well as others, alleging the men were part of a national crime syndicate known as the Colombo Crime Family, which operated as one of the five families at Cosa Nostra. The prosecution claimed the lethal crew of hitters were operating under the orders of the family's acting boss, Tommy Schatz, and was said to be responsible for carrying out multiple murders, as well as other charges. While the government continued its investigation, Dino, Big Dino Calabro, and Joseph Joey Caves Compatiello were both join Team America and begin cooperating against their former partners. Jolie would end up being convicted of several racketeering and murder conspiracy charges in 2012 and sentenced to 18 years in prison. Jolie's release date has been set for May 2nd, 2024. Gioli would be convicted for plotting the hits on John Minerva and Frank Marasa and was separately charged for orchestrating violence against mob rivals to gain power, but was acquitted of other murders that could have potentially landed in multiple life sentences, which included the 1997 murder of NYPD officer Ralph Doles, as well as the hit on William Wild Bill Cotolo in 1999, and the 1995 execution of Richard Greaves. The judge surprised everyone when he sentenced Gioli to only 18 years instead of the maximum 20-year sentence he could have given him. Dino, little Dino Saracino, would receive a 50-year sentence after being found guilty of conspiring to murder Colombo underboss Joseph Joey Scopo by running reconnaissance on Scopo for his acting boss Tommy Gioli and reporting on Scopo's movements and locations. He was found guilty for his role in the murder of Richard Greaves, as well as Wild Bill, where Dino's own brother, Sebi Saracino, would testify against him. For Sebi's cooperation against his brother and boss, he would receive time served. Dino, Big Dino, Calabro would confess to eight murders and a host of other crimes and help place Gioli, Saracino, and others on multiple homicides and would receive 11-year sentence for his cooperation. Joseph Joey Caves Compatiello would receive a 12-year sentence for admitting his role in five gangland murders and testifying against his former partners in crime. Thomas Irish Tommy McLaughlin, Gioli's cousin, 
would end up under Scarpa until he was busted in 1996 for running a drug operation. McLaughlin would be released in 2008 and coming home to a family that was on a sinking ship and implicating him in the murder of Frank Marassa. Irish Tommy would contact the FBI scared he could face life in prison and agreed to wear a wire. He would record a bunch of active mobsters saying incriminating things, which would land him a sentence of time served and a new identity for him and his wife in the witness protection program.